Once again, we are exploring the intricacies and nuances of theoretical competitive Pokemon sciences. And today we explored field conditions, which are often seen but rarely grouped together or named. They're absolutely everywhere, from weather to dual screens to terrains to many others. In fact, it's quite rare to see a battle without at least one, though they're usually overlapping, especially nowadays. Think of something as commonplace as Alolan Ninetales using Aurora Veil. With just one turn, you've got both hail or snow depending on the gen and sometimes it doesn't even need a turn if you have a lead off with koridon versus maridon you've got sun and electric terrain active without any actual moves made bringing this new set of circumstances to the battlefield has a ton of impact on games everything from power speed bulk even accuracy and the hp stat itself can be altered so today we're going to explore why, through their colossal influence, field conditions can feel pretty close to everything, otherwise known as the Kabutops Theorem. But first, this video is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon is one of the biggest names in premium audio and are one of the cleanest sounding earbuds you'll ever have. I use Raycon for basically everything, from when I go for walks while listening to podcasts, working out while listening to music, or when I need to listen to specific sounds while editing videos just like these. These Raycon everyday earbuds are my go-to for premium sound quality, but Raycon also has a ton of great products too, and they have expanded their inventory to include products like the everyday headphones and the Raycon power tech products like the Magic 180 charging cable and the faucet filter. And if you want some sick audio products and also support the channel to to help us produce more content, Raycon has an early Black Friday promotion across their entire website with 20% off of everything as select products up to 50% off. Get an early start on holiday sales by shopping Raycon's early Black Friday sale today. Go to buyraycon.com FSG to get 20 to 50% off site-wide. The first and most obvious field condition that would come to the minds of most is weather, which has been one of the most powerful, prominent influences on the game since its inception in Generation 2, where sun, rain, and sand first came into existence. There were no abilities back then, so they could only be set up manually. In those days, sun was the best of the three. There weren't any super powerful water Pokemon which needed rain to boost their stabs. The strongest of them, Vaporeon, already had the special attacking boosting growth, which didn't have a turn duration didn't limit the power to Vaporeon's stab, and didn't give thunders from opposing legendary electrics perfect accuracy. Sandstorm was more useful, as in Gen 2, it actually outdamaged leftovers, dealing 12.5% as opposed to the 6.25% of Gen 3 and onwards. This meant it could be used as useful chip on popular targets like Snorlax, the Electrics, and Cloyster. This was first thought to be the tool for stalled teams, with an actual OU niche for Omastar, but eventually it was discovered that the sand chip was more well suited for offensive threats like Needle King and Tyranitar, sand immune Pokemon who love the extra chip on their sand affected checks. Of course, Sandstorm would also hit one's own Pokemon, so one had to take care to build a team with Rock, Steel, and Ground types to be as unaffected by it as possible. You wouldn't want to put your own Snorlax in Thunder 2 hit KO range because of Sand after all. And thus, Sand was decent but highly, highly specific. On that subject, a common misconception is that Sand also reduces Thunder's accuracy to 50%, but that's not the case. The only weather that does do that is Sun, which is far and away the best in Gen 2. It's single hand creates a legitimately terrifying niche for Moltres, who uses its boost as well as its held item Charcoal to launch Fire Blast that can 2-hit KO Snorlax with the slightest bit of chip damage. Reducing the accuracy of the Electric Thunder is also superb, as is the less important yet still valuable weakening of Stab Surfs. Plus, it could even make Needle King's Morning Sun heal much more than usual. Certain variants of Belly Drum Charizard could play a similar trick. Its Sunny Blast combo didn't quite pack the same incinerating impact of Moltres, but it still hit quite hard and gave Zard a more immediate, less risky way while providing support against opposing thunders at that. Now, as good as Sun, almost always Moltres, could be, weather was quite rare overall in Gen 2. But then Generation 3 came, and with the introduction of abilities, including the weather setting abilities Drought, Drizzle, and Sandstream, whose effect was permanent unless replaced with another weather ability or move, completely changed the way weather was used. 
immediately making it one of the most commonplace reliable strategies around a dynamic which remains to this day across every tier imaginable starting with Groudon and Kyogre reshaping ubers in their image funnily enough gen 3 also introduced hail as a weather but no weather setting ability and it didn't even boost blizzard to unmissable status like rain does for thunder that would change in gen 4 alongside obama snow and its snow warning coming to make hail a legitimate strategy especially alongside diabolus and pokemon ice body wall rain weather is generally known for its ability to hurt not heal but ice body and rain dish are exceptions the latter even letting specially defensive ludicolo act as an answer to kyogre of all things in gen 4 ubers the power of weather setting abilities was such that not even fully evolved pokemon like hippopotas and snover were incredible enablers of powerful abusers in lower tiers despite not being very good pokemon in their own right even gen 6 and onwards where the effect is no longer permanent weather abilities are still hugely important especially as those gens can see the users extend the duration of the weathers with their respective items heat rock damp rock smooth rock and icy rock as setting up the effect simply by switching in makes it much easier to enable all the threats utilizing it it also helps that whereas the distribution of weather abilities used to be much rarer they have become much more prominent over the years generation 3 knew what they were doing regarding weather as they also introduced the speed doubling chlorophyll and swift swim the rain side of things got the better end of this deal though as swift swim swimmers were water types meaning that they didn't just get faster they got their stabs strengthened too whereas the grass type chlorophyll pokemon did not have such a benefit uncharged solar beam while great was nothing compared to hydro pump becoming 180 base power and getting boost to hidden power fire while nice wasn't enough to split the difference grass fire coverage was also much more limited than water ice to say nothing of the fact that water being weather boosted meant it was much more capable of overwhelming opponents through force alone generation 5 pushed this even further with rain boosting the newly added hurricane to unmissable status as well this was already scary on the likes of tornadus dragonite and volcarona because yes even the fire type volcarona functioned on rain using both hurricane and even a boost hidden power water to smack checks like heat ran and terrakion but was elevated to downright terrifying status with the addition of tornadus therian a monster that would go on to be effective even in ubers then again rain was already a terror in gens 3 and especially 4 of ou even though it had to be set manually such was the power of swift swims and stab boosts with the likes of kingdra kabutops ludicolo and friends unleashing some of the most nigh unstoppable offense allowed in standard play rain was also favored over sun not just because it was stronger in its boost but because it matched up better against the ou weather setter the water weak tyranitar and yes we finally arrive at bellatar himself bringing permanent weather to ou for the first time whose constant sand chip was peerless in its influence from generations three through five and whose presence barely diminished once the sand was no longer permanent in gen 6 especially once rock types began receiving special defense boosts under sand in gen 4 which immediately turned tyranitar into one of the best special tanks in the game devouring pretty much everything thunderbolts sure but draco meteors yeah that too and also super effective moves like heat ran's earth power and even stab surfs and hydro pumps and the most specially bulky of them could all even withstand gengar focus blast the sand special defense boost wasn't just valuable for tar either even pokemon like dpp aerodactyl black and white terrakion and sometimes even auras mega diancy could take advantage of it not just ou either rock arceus under sand was so hilariously specially bulky it could withstand kiram white despite not resisting its moves sand affected everything with its ever pervasive chip damage even before tyranitar and its gen 4 comrade hippowdon had any teammates they could directly elevate to the next level sand's presence alone was the single biggest factor in preventing gen 3 suicune and Salak heracross from running through everything for example while sand cutting into the longevity of otherwise devastating threats like salamence and infernate was a major point in gen 4 but then generation 5 Five unleashed Sand Rush Extra Drill and Sand Force Landorus on the world to devastating effect, and Sand centric teams became even more powerful. There's a good reason why so many teams from that era loaded up on Steel's rocks and grounds. They had major advantages over their sand affected counterparts. Oh, and we haven't mentioned it much because the strategies wound up getting banned for being uncompetitive, not quite the same as overpowered, but Sand Veil was also subject to such scathing hatred. Sand was so prominent as to make setup effortless, and the likes of 
Guard Charm, Gliscor, and even Cacturn, of all things, abuse the RNG to devastating effect. Nothing like missing Ice Beams with the accuracy of Stone Edge against a Pokemon with a substitute up. Generation 5 also ensured Chlorophyll got its due, buffing growth to double both special attack and attack under Sun. Suddenly, the grass types wielding it were just as scary as everything else, and Sun was no longer only that thing that was good in Ubers because it came with using Groudon. It was now ripping through OU as well, led by the newly chlorophyll gifted Venusaur, and occasionally other grasses like Sauzbuck and Lilligant, though it was also bolstered by new fires in Volcarona, Victini, and Darmanitan, as well as even Heatran gaining Flame Charge as an option. In fact, Generation 5's OU Perma Weather didn't last long in its unrestricted form. The speed doubling abilities for Sun, Rain, and Sand all wound up being too much for the tier. Sun continued to excel in Gen 6 and onwards, though it wasn't abusing Chlorophyll anymore. No, now it was blasting through everything in sight with Mega Charizard Y and occasionally pairing it with Heatran and sometimes even Victini in Gen 7. It's a shame Hale didn't get Slush Rush until Gen 7. Of course, once it did, Hale suddenly became more than just a side effect of using a Bomb Snow or a Roarus. Good Pokemon in their own right. No, now you wanted to let a speed doubled Swords Dance Alolan Sand Slash go berserk on the opponent. And then Gen 8 took it to the next level with the viciously powerful Arctozone. And then Generation 9 took it even further by changing Hail to Snow, removing the chip damage, and providing a 50% defense boost for Ice types, which helped make Backscalibur extremely hilariously broken. Before buffs like these, the boosts for Ice types generally weren't sufficiently worthwhile to justify stacking the worst defensive type in the game, as the peak as far as OU was concerned was taking advantage of Obama Snow's unique qualities, like being a grass type unafraid of Ice Beam, combined with the dragon stopping priority of Ice Shard. And of course, while this could definitely backfire at times, one also tried to take advantage of hail nullifying leftovers on steel types, helping even the playing field for Pokemon that would have been affected by sand either way, or limiting the counters to threats like Jirachi. Basically, no matter what it's doing, weather has been a significant part of the competitive scene for over two decades now, and doesn't look to be slowing down at all. Even Ubers finally has its second Sunsetter now. It's just not Groudon anymore, but Coridon as well. On the subject of Ubers, Rayquaza's airlock ability is actually enormous simply because it nullifies weather. It can freely spam V-Creates without worrying about it getting weakened by rain, for example. And this anti-weather capability it has is a big part of what makes Ray as good as it is in Ubers. Also on the subject of Ubers, we will now conclude the weather section of this video with the reason why it's called the Kabutops Theorem. In Generations 4 and 5, Kabutops is a superb UU and RU Pokemon respectively. It has some slight OU viability in Generation 4 OU, where it can be a terrifying rain sweeper or an offbeat bulky sand rapid spinner, but this is incredibly specific. It's really a lower tier Pokemon, not getting used by the best players in the most important OU tournaments. However, Kabutops does get used by the best players in the most important tournaments in another tier. No, not just Gen 4 UU and Gen 5 RU. We're talking Ubers in both generations. Permanent rain enabling Kabutops isn't a surprise. After all, it was one of the most outrageously overpowered Swift Swimmers, leading to the Drizzle Swim ban in early Gen 5 OU. But for it to be as incredible as it is in Ubers is something else entirely. Here is a Pokemon with a field condition active that immediately begins competing with the likes of Arceus itself. And oh yeah, Gen 5 Ubers doesn't just see Kabutops as a late game cleaner that outspeeds Scarfers like Genesect by a mile and crushes the majority of Pokemon seen with Rain active. That certainly is the case, but Kabutops is also regularly used as an Arceus check because its waterfalls hit so hard and on the physical side, meaning it doesn't fear Calm Mind variants, while its good defense and normal resistance allow it to withstand the mighty Extreme Killer. Oh, there's also the fact that Kabutops packs the amazing team support of Rapid Spin, and its immense power means it's capable of dealing with the incredibly bulky spin blockers populating the tier. Kingdra could never. As a lower tier Pokemon using a field condition to launch itself into the highest tier there is, Kabutops is a perfect encapsulation of the concept and has thoroughly earned its position as the face of this theorem.
Next, we move on to the Terrains. They have not been around as long as Weather, but they have been similarly impactful since they exploded onto the scene in Generation 7. Now, technically, the moves Misty, Grassy, Electric, and Psychic Terrain existed in Generation 6, but beyond some Geomancy Xerneas variants that were rare to the point of barely even existing themselves, they were never actually used, as it was generally far too difficult to make use of them when requiring manual setup, to say nothing of the move slot they required. However, when players gained the ability to summon Rain through the Surge abilities in Generation 7, and the Pokemon with those abilities, the Tapus, were some of the best around, their support potential became recognized. Terrains immediately shaped the game to incredible, multifaceted degrees with how they enabled so many Pokemon. Sure, they had to be grounded, but that still meant a huge portion of OU was affected by at least one terrain, usually more. Grassy Terrain's passive recovery was incredible, and its strengthening of grass moves and weakening of Earthquake wasn't far behind. These combined to help make Heatran more vicious than ever, especially the Bloom Doom variants and Tapu Bulu, in addition to having strong defensive presence, was also one of the most consistent hard hitters in OU since its own grassy terrain helped it offset the recoil for its boosted wood hammers. Misty Terrain's status blocking meant threats like Garchomp and Kartana no longer had to fear skulls from Toxapex, helping them unleash the full brunt of their power, and the weakening of dragon moves, while rare in effect since Tapu Fini's existence to scourge the moves in general, could be majorly helpful when taking on something like Zygarde, while Tapu Fini was excellent in its own right as a check to threats, defogger, and even a stall breaker with nature's madness and taunt. Electric Terrain's sleep blocking effect wasn't seen much in practice, but the powering up of electric moves didn't just help make Tapu Koko powerful in addition to its tremendous Greninja beating natural speed, especially with choice specs. It also bolstered the already strong electric coverage of powerful teammates like Magirna and Kieran Black. Finally, Tapu Lele's psychic terrain also blocked priority, which gave it immense utility in helping block the likes of Astro Ninja's Water Shuriken and Mega Maw Wild Sucker Punch in late game scenarios. But its primary function was to make its own psychics and psy shocks capable of tearing through everything in the game, while also helping teammates like Mega Alakazam and Metacham become even more ludicrously popular. Psychic terrain was so good, Tapu Lele even saw usage in Ubers alongside Deoxys attack. And hey, what if there was a Pokemon that could abuse all four terrains? Well, that Pokemon was Mega Metagross, and it absolutely slaughtered OU while it was allowed. It perfectly took advantage of the fact that there was usually some sort of terrain on the field, whether it was passively healing and shrugging off one of its few weaknesses in Earthquake under grassy terrain, being unaffected by Scald Burns under Misty terrain, and while it didn't intend to pack both Thunder Punch and Zed Headbutt, either move being powered up made it even more ludicrously difficult to check. The former cleaving through Celesteela, and the latter crushing Rotom Wash. Had it not been for the terrains, Mega Metagross still would have been a borderline case, given its immediate 350 speed upon Mega Evolving that it received in Gen 7, but with the terrains, it was just outrageous. With how popular and effective the Tapus were, their terrains clashed, canceling each other out turn after turn. The entire generation was built on the dynamics of the terrains, and this continued into Generation 8. Even though the terrains now provided a 30% boost to their attacking types, as opposed to their previous whopping 50%, their effects were still huge, with Tapu Lele in particular being pretty much as unstoppable as before. Other users of terrain popped up too, most notably Rillaboom, but even the lower tiers began finding ways to incorporate terrains with the likes of NDDF, Pinchurchin, and even Thwacky. Even if the Pokemon themselves weren't the best, the effects of terrain were so powerful that, like weather, they were worth the team slot. Of course, most terrain setters are great standalone Pokemon who are also amazing team support, which is a perfect opportunity to mention that the delightful Grookey was an essential part of Little Cup in its own right. Next, we move on to screens. These have been around since Generation 1, although there they were different, as Reflect and Light Screen would have the damage from the corresponding side of the physical special spectrum until their user switched out. But then Gen 2 came around and turned them into the screens we have known ever since, where they have the damage for several turns. Duration potentially lengthened by Gen 4's Light Clay, but the effect extends to any team member that may enter battle during that time. Gens 2 and 3 saw legitimate usage of screens, but 
but they weren't as regular, nor were they used in the same way they were in Generation 4 and onward, where they took on the style they continue to be known for today. Both screens combine on a fast-paced lead like Azov, holding Light Clay for maximum duration in order to support a cascade of powerful sweepers, their snowball effect amplified by the fact that they could not be revenge killed with opposing attacks, removing a Choice Scarf's ability to check a Dragon Dancer as it normally might, for example. In Gens 2 and 3, the power level wasn't nearly comparable to Gen 4 and onward with Stealth Rock, Life Orb, and moves like Close Combat and Buffed Outrage. Furthermore, the lack of Light Clay meant it'd be incredibly difficult to set up both screens and get use of them before they expired. Thus, whenever a screen was used, it was usually just one, and their use was more specific. Furthermore, the use wasn't only to support offense. For instance, in Gen 3, Light Screen on something like Milotech, Zapdos, or Celebi didn't just help slow down Combine spam teams, but was also excellent support for the likes of Skarmory, now no longer immediately dead to Magneton, or as afraid of Fire Blast from mixed attackers like Salamence or Tyranitar. While Gen 2 stall teams enjoyed Reflect Raikou to slow down threats like Marowak, Machamp, and various explosions. Of course, offense was also enabled by screens in these gens, mostly in Gen 2 actually. Their light screen often set by Zapdos was an amazing tool to help many different threats set up in the face of the legendary Electrics, whose power was suddenly reduced to unthreatening levels for this temporary period, thus enabling the likes of Growth Vaporeon, Curse Machamp, Swords Dance Marowak, or the Belly Drummer Snorlax and Charizard. However, the use of screens as defensive support remains an unrelated part of their game, especially with how useful they can be to slow down power creep. Of course, with how Seto Sweepers get stronger and stronger, it is natural to use dual screens to support them instead. In fact, dual screens have not been without their share of controversy as a team style for how effortlessly they can turn setting up and mashing strong attacks into a viable strategy. Claims of such strategies, so-called cheapness, have been lobbed at such teams ever since Azel first supported Dragon Dancers in Gen 4, but the sentiment became far more widespread in Generation 6 and 7. Gen 6 had the screen set up by one of the nastiest Pokemon in the game in its own right, Superior, and it was doing so to enable sweepers which were already ridiculous, becoming downright unreasonable on their screens. Tail Glow Manaphy, and Quiver Dance Volcarona. In Generation 7, the style became even nastier by virtue of Alola Ninetales and its Aurora Veil, a move which combined Reflect and Light Screen. This was amazing to ensure maximum duration. Oh sure, Aurora Veil was only usable under Hail. Ah, oh, never mind, Alola Ninetales' ability was Snow Warning. It briefly terrorized Gen 7 OU by making the likes of Zygarde and Magirna even more horrifyingly unkillable as they blasted through everything in sight. It was banned from UU for similar antics and became a fully fledged OU Pokemon in Generation 8 and 9, most recently helping elevate Baxcalibur's brokenness into the stratosphere. Aurora Veil was so potent, it even was worth using in more convoluted ways. For instance, Gen 7 NU saw Aurora's lead off to set up Snow Warning, so Alolan Sand Slash could come in and set up Aurora Veil, and that was more than sufficient for the monstrous threats it was supporting in Vivalon, Turtonator, Barbaco, and Virizion. Trick Room Speed Flipping Effect is much more of a double strategy than a singles one. That's not to say it hasn't been used to great effect in singles, because it has, but dedicated Trick Room teams are quite rare and not really consistent in singles. There's no item to extend its duration, there's no ability that sets it up on switching, and games aren't as short as in singles. Exceptions do exist, of course, mainly Gen 4 Ubers, where Dialga and Palkia's excellence made the style more consistent than it'd usually be, and a period in late Gen 7 OU where the team style briefly dominated the metagame with Alola Marowak, Mega Mawile, and Crowdon unleashing their full power alongside the always excellent Magirna. However, Trick Room's most successful history in singles has not been using it as the backbone of an entire team, but instead using it on a standalone Pokemon that uses it as an offensive move, most notably Generation 4. Just as Metagross might use agility, Bronzong would use Trick Room, suddenly outspeeding everything and acting as one of the scariest late game sweepers around with its superpower Gyro Ball. In Generation 5, offensive Trick Room Reuniclus was similarly frightening. What was excellent about this style was how they couldn't be outsped. As fast as agility Metagross might be, for instance, there were still Scarfers that outran it, but there was no Scarfer that would avoid Annihilation from Bronzong. Now, the field effect nature of the move, as opposed to a standalone boost, meant Trick Room on such Pokemon was unique in how it could be used as a support tool as well. It could be used defensively, turning the tables on whatever the fastest Pokemon 
Pokemon might be. This was useful offensively as well, of course, in how it completely bypassed all speed creep as opposed to having to try and use faster and faster Pokemon, unboosted and scarfed alike. But defensively, it was valuable in providing security against fast-paced offense, and it being a field effect meant it didn't necessarily need Bronzong to do the job itself. It could help a more apt teammate beat a faster threat by setting Trick Room for it. Additionally, the field effect nature of the move meant that while Bronzong could use it for its own ends, it also had the potential to use it as support for a teammate, so it wasn't completely standalone. Most famously, it paired up with Choice Bad Tyranitar, which obliterated all in sight when outspeeding it wasn't an option, while Mixed Dragonite was similarly ferocious. Packing a big gun alongside the Trick Room Sweeper was dual-pronged in its effectiveness. Either the big gun broke down the opposing team for the Trick Room Sweeper to win, or the Trick Roomer could set up a late-game sweep for the big gun. This strategy was so good it even extended to Bronzong setting up late-game Giratina Origin sweeps and Ubers. Meanwhile, in Generation 5, Reuniclix paired with a Scarfer meant no matter what, it would always have the tools to beat the opponent through speed late game. Either the Scarfer would outspeed their options and thus would do so with immediacy, or if one had Scarf Garchomp against the team with Scarf Latios, leaving it unable to clean, then Reuniclix would become the go-to option. Finally, Trick Room threats were generally seen as non-boosting, meaning they could potentially be staved off defensively. But then Nasty Plot Trick Room Slowking would brutally punish this assumption, able to pick its move based on the matchup, and potentially having enough bulk to pull off both. Funnily enough, Trick Room has variant moves, Magic Room and Wonder Room, and they aren't really used. Magic Room has been theorized as effective for its item neutralizing effect, potentially removing Scarfer's ability to outspeed threats, but hasn't seen almost anything in the way of practical use, whereas Wonder Room's effect of switching defense and special defense doesn't really provide much of anything. The last few field conditions are on the sparser side. The speed doubling Tailwind is another strategy that dominates doubles, but is rare in singles. It was non-existent for its short 3 turn duration in Gen 4, but even after its extension to 4 turns in Gen 5, it was rare as a strategy. Some players experimented with Tailwind offense in Generation 5 to decent effect. Little scarier than Kyurem Black under Tailwind after all, but the style was far less consistent than more standard versions of Hyper Offense. There was semi-regular use of Tailwind Tailwind in Gen 5 OU though. It was just used as more of a defensive tactic. With, with Prankster, Tornadus had priority on his Tailwind and could thus sacrifice itself to use the move in the face of a boosted sweeper like Volcarona, allowing a follow-up teammate to outspeed it. That was really it though. Beyond that, Tailwind has been little more than a gimmick in singles, barring the very rare Tailwind Source Dance Mega Charizard X. Gravity is extremely rare and is like Trick Room. No duration extending item, no ability to summon it, and its effect isn't necessarily drastic enough to justify an entire team devoted to it. It's rarer than Trick Room even when used by standalone Pokemon. Its use is pretty much entirely restricted to being used as an offensive weapon by Lander Asterion. But wow, what a weapon it is. Forget withstanding its massive earthquakes with flying types or levitate Pokemon. Skarmory or Rotom Wash go from being solid answers to running from it in terror. And these don't work. Nearly nothing is going to be able to take it on. Of course, gravity cuts both ways. So gravity Lando T is usually usually paired with a grass type that resists opposing earthquakes, which it becomes vulnerable to itself. Paris Song is extremely rare in newer generations, but in generations 2 through 5, where there were plenty of slow, bulky setup sweepers that could potentially win the game once they were the last Pokemon on their team and could no longer be phased out by stall teams that couldn't actually hurt them, Paris Song, almost always used by Celebi, was a method of ensuring they would not win in that situation. They would simply faint in 3 turns. This was useful for all manner of threats. Cursed Thorlax, Calm Mind Suicune, Calm Mind Jirachi, Calm Mind Reuniclus, etc. In generations 4 and 5, Celebi could even pair Parish Song with U-Turn to force an opponent to switch out, and then safely scout what would switch in. Fairy and Dark Aura, as well as No Guard, are usually thought of as the abilities that make Xerneas, Yveltal, and Machamp as strong as they are. And that's of course true, but they are field conditions because they power up all of the Fairy or Dark moves being used, or make all moves impossible to miss. This is actively used by Clefki. Xerneas' go-to check in Generation 6 Ubers. Xerneas can't hope to block his Thunder Waves through Substitute because Klefki's Stab Play Rough is powered up sufficiently by Fairy Aura to break it, effectively using Xerneas' ability against it. This dynamic is also quite reassuring for anyone trying to will a whisk of a champ. Finally, there are those that are not used at all. Mud and Water Sport, while theoretically having some use, are generally outclassed by things like screens. There's not really any point to uproar sleep blocking effect either, and the play 
ledges, while potentially powerful, are far too specific by virtue of their limited users to get used in doubles, although it did happen a few times in tournaments. And that's it! Field conditions are a huge part of Pokemon and can almost be overwhelming to keep track of at all times as they stack in new generations, like when there's Aurora Veil and Hail and a terrain on top of that. But it's not just a lot to keep track of, it's a lot that's influencing the Pokemon on the field. Their importance can't be overstated. Entire niches are built around them. It's why we named this video after Kabutops. Perma Rain's power propelled it to a massively important Uber Pokemon, key to anchoring many great teams and generations. 4 and 5. Despite the fact that Cobbletops without Rain is a lower tier Pokemon, a great one no doubt, but nothing you'd expect to be hanging out with Arceus. Now all we need are those abilities which will kick up Trick Room and Gravity on entry. Perhaps a Paradox form of Dialga and Palkia? Cause I'ma be real, the Origin forms aren't it, man. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and in the comments, I want to know, what did you think about our video? Was there anything you want us to talk about? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. And thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.